Hi there and welcome to the channel of a disappointed man with me Jason Kennedy the disappointed man and the um, the rain is so heavy here and the sky is so dark that I have retreated to my um, study slash um, junk room for this brief video and it will be like a review this time and um, what I'm going to talk about are two short story collections that I've just finished reading um, the first of which chronologically is Prosper Merry May with his Carmen and other stories and he really begins his writing career in 1846 he's associated with um, French Romanticism and he helps to establish the um, short story as a form in French letters and the second one is um, Catherine Mansfield uh, 1909 her early collection in a German pension okay and um, just a note on this version this um, Penguin version has very small type uh, it's really not good for reading, but it does have the explanatory notes. Um, the collected stories, this is how I read the in a German pension. Okay, so for students and for reading. Okay, clear that up. Now, um, Mansfield is also an innovator, and her innovations happen within the context of literary um, modernism. And we'll, we'll touch on those. All right, so let's get started. I think I'll begin with um, Catherine Mansfield. And um, I'm going to use like one term from narrative theory to kind of home in on um, a point of interest. And that will be from, um, this will be the moment of narration. And it's drawn from like the work of this guy, Gerard Jeannette. And this book is um, such a great book on narrative theory because it defines pretty much all the formal properties of a narrative. Um, so any, any students uh, who want to get into this, I would recommend this because it defines them and it defines them in a simple language even an idiot such as myself can understand and use to identify and to speak precisely about parts of stories and it's very useful for then entering into um, sort of comparative work so what is this moment of narration now it's really the distance in time um, between the events that are narrated and the narrator themselves so um, a general, generally you'll find that subsequent narration is favoured where the events of the tale happened um, well prior to, um, to them being, um, being told so um, in stories in um, Prosper Mary Mary that's very much the case um, a story will be narrated when all the, um, the protagonists of the tale are, are dead okay so they take on this kind of historical um, dimension there so you get so it works very well because you can use real facts of history to produce these kind of pseudo historical um, stories which include like incidents that really did happen um, that provide this kind of context into which the, um, the imaginative is um, sprinkled okay it can be done very artfully Robert Louis Stevenson in Treasure Island is a great example as well where before they set off on the voyage all the details of the itinerary and how they plan the um, the crossing um, is done so well that it creates this frame, this kind of um, feeling of um, verisimilitude that this could be a real voyage, very very artful. Stevenson is, is um, very good at doing this compared to other people that write these kinds of um, romances. All right, back to Mansfield. So the way it works is in Mansfield is it's not done in this subsequent way. It's done with this kind of simultaneous narration. So the idea here is that the events in the story are happening in front of your, your very eyes. Okay, so that really draws you in, makes it very intimate reading experience. And it's also the method that was favoured by Denton Welsh throughout his um, highly autobiographical novels because it's tied to the observing eye. So the more precise this observing eye is, it draws you back towards the moment of perception itself. Okay, so that's what's going on in Catherine Mansfield. And she is extremely good at it. And she's probably not as good um, on the visual part as Denton Welsh, but perhaps she's stronger on the kind of gestural and the movement part, how figures move and arrange themselves. So she's quite painterly in that way like Welsh, but she's not so interested in those um, precise visual details that he will use to coin kind of novel <coughs> ways of representing 
<coughs> experience that almost verge upon kind of um, the phenomenological. You know, there's this process of where it's almost like defamiliarization. It's like you're seeing things so freshly in Welsh that it's like the first time you've ever seen them. No, that's not what we find in, in Catherine Welsh. But what she does is she kind of is able to break down every single element of a short story and, and really command it. So although some of these are very short, um, they're, they're really rich in their formal qualities and some of them are almost like finger exercises for her as she develops her literary art because they're so slender, they're so slight that there's almost like the, the hold on the reader is all produced by the literary art, it's all produced by technique. Even in war is another writer that was really good at this as well and he, um, he kind of in a way almost um, challenged himself in his travelogue that he wrote which is a great travel book. It's one of my favorites because nothing happens in it. And he has to write page after page about this journey through Latin America, nothing happening, like maybe the donkey gets a stone in its hoof on day 32, is about the highlight of the, of the interest. But he can still do it because um, Evelyn War's grasp of technique is so sure that he can spin um, a tale from nothing at all, from the most meagre materials, and he does show off pure technique. I think it's called 92 Days, it's over there, so I might 93, 91, but um, even the title hints at just the being absolutely nothing of, of interest. So um, Mansfield is control of the elements, as I say, and because of that, if you were studying short stories or you wanted to write them yourself, she's a great place to begin, and you can almost um, cover up like one element of, um, of, the, of the story or single out an element and focus on it and then look at the interplay to see how these um, tales really work. So you might read just the direct speech in one of the stories and just follow the line of that with, and, and skip everything else and see what the effect of that is. Then you cover it up and you just read like the descriptions of how the people are moving or the backdrop or the narrator's thoughts because that is another interesting thing here. The, um, the narrator that emerges um, from the, um, the different stories that all share the same kind of story world is um, very light, very refined, very cultured and very discerning and very particular and also has to be said quite, quite witty. And I'll just give one example of how Catherine Mansfield considers like the smallest formal element and what you can do with it to break it and instead of a closure create an openness. Okay so here is the end of this story called The Love Bad which really short, very funny. It's about her experiences in this kind of communal bathing with all these other women. And she says at the end it's about how she kind of gives up on uh, socializing with the other women and just retreats behind an umbrella and she says um, the umbrella the umbrellas are the saving grace of the Luftbad. Now when I go, I take my husband's storm gamp and sit in a corner hiding behind it. Not that I'm in the least ashamed of my legs. Okay, so it's, it's like this feminine thing that she's not, um, it's, it's not that there's anything you know, aesthetically displeasing about her legs. But the point of interest here is this last line. Not that I'm in the least ashamed of my legs. <clears throat> what she does is, when she revises this story later, she breaks the line. And she says, not that I am in the least ashamed, dash, and leaves it. So you, you don't know what she's ashamed of, you see. So the last line of the story opens up. Opens it up rather than closing it. So that's how minute her attention to detail is. And that's why people have returned to these stories kind of again and again. And I'll, ju I'll just cite, cite one little bit more of quotation while we're here. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of how funny it is as well. It's terribly funny. And um, one story called The Advanced Lady, and this is not the narrator, it's this kind of um, a new woman writer figure who, who comes and enchants everyone. And oh, we've never seen a woman who writes before. They don't realize that the narrator themselves and Catherine Mansfield are busy recording these minute observations of what's going on because she doesn't declare her project to them. She's happy to conceal um, that she's 
cast um, that she's subjecting them to this almost kind of anthropological gaze. But here's your um, funny moment if you want a taste of the humour here, which is um, they're going on this journey, like this walk, and they're going to walk um, like a number of kilometres, all these sick people who were there at the pension to take the cure. And um, they're going to this place called Schlingen. And then they're going to return, but it's an, it's an eight kilometre walk, supposedly. And um, this old man on their route, like an old rustic, a clown, a peasant, kind of challenges them. That is eight kilometres, shouted an old, um, one old man with a white beard who leaned against a fence, fanning himself with a yellow handkerchief. Seven and a half, answered Herr Erhard um, um, shortly. Eight, bellowed the sage. Seven and a half, eight. The man is mad, said Herr Erhard. Well, please let him be mad in peace, said I, putting my hands over my ears. Such ignorance must not be allowed to go uncontradicted, said he, and turning his back on us, too exhausted to cry out any longer, he held up seven and a half fingers. Eight, thundered the grey beard with pristine freshness. They have another encounter on the, on the way back. There is a kind of humour at work in um, Kathleen Mansfield's stories. Now, um, the stories break apart into kind of two classes and one would be concerned with the kind of the um, middle class um, characters who are fascinated by the upper class characters and there's one story that plays upon this called the sister of the baron where all is not what it seems in the, uh, the social hierarchy and it causes a um, furore when the, when the truth emerges again in the in the final sentence and then there are also these um, stories where they're all about the lower class kind of servant characters, particularly the um, the female ones, like long-suffering wives with hints of spousal abuse. And um, one with a girl called The Girl Who Was Tired, which has a, a really um, dramatic ending. But it has all these scenes of um, domestic abuse of this girl. It's really um, difficult to kind of get through. And it's a little bit, on, on my reading, it's like a fairy tale, like Cinderella, but with all the magic and all the happy bit, and the prince, and the ball, and the fairy godmother, all taken away, and just the bad stuff. That's how it, that's how it kind of strikes me. But it's, it's kind of up to you as a reader how much you want to believe that this kind of um, rather timeless, like rural life that's being depicted, its rhythms are really capable of um, forming part of the kind of feminist critique with, um, with which um, Mansfield um, is, is kind of strongly associated in her writing and her kind of extracurricular um, activities. So that is the, um, the Catherine Mansfield. Do I recommend reading it? Oh yes, very much so, I do. Um, there are some kind of um, problematic parts with it that I'll, I'll come on to. Now, Prosper Marimé. Prosper Marimé. It's a bit easier to kind of deal with it's like in the vein of, um, I guess, like writers like Sir Walter Scott. And what you see in the gap, the historical gap, because, because like um, Mary May is like the 19th century character, Catherine Mansfield is like the turn of the century, like 20th century character. And you see this big difference in what it means in terms of status to be um, a writer. Um, Mary May is writing at a um, during a period where um, gentlemen would not even attach their names to their literary productions for the fear it might do to their reputation. So um, producing literature would lower you in the estimation of your peers. It would not um, raise you up. Okay, so Walter Scott, Scott very famously kind of published the, um, the first The Waverly novels anonymously, you know, because he, he didn't want um, it to um, have any kind of impact on his um, professional reputation. And um, Mary May has um, sort of an element of that. So what you have there is a is a kind of person, like a man of parts, where they have um, they're not drawing upon their status as writers for their, um, their um, to be heard or to or to participate in society. It's kind of incidental. So Mary May was like a civil servant and worked inside the government administration. So he could have some direct input into kind of policy making, into the political at that during that period. So it's very unashamedly conservative and it doesn't really worry about 
the social order greatly. It might, it might take an interest in how in that social order, but it's not advocating any kind of reform necessarily. Even though like one story, this um, very good story called um, Tamango, could be seen on, um, on one reading as offering a kind of um, critique of um, slavery because it concerns a slaver who is kind of undone by his um, greed. Um, what, as I say, what you find is there's no need for the writer to, um, and the narrator in here to conceal their kind of their their privilege. Uh, I just want to give you one example though, where of his dialogue, where it's it's just kind of as witty as um, what you find in Catherine Mansfield, even if it is these kind of like more um, subsequent narration or this kind of trying to set these tales into a historical frame. They also do use in like the drawing room scenes. And in some of the action scenes, they also use this simultaneous narration to kind of heighten the dramatic effect rather than to try and kind of implicate you in the um, um, sort of in, in the action, in the way Mansfield does and like Dickens would do to try and get you to say this cannot stand. Something must be done about spousal abuse or abuse of servants in rural Germany now. You know, or something must be done about the treatment of, of children in, in London, in Victorian London. Right now, reader, don't you agree? And Dickens will even um, apostrophize the, um, the reader in this way and say, how can you let this stand? Put this novel down and write a letter to your member of parliament. But this is in this um, exchange in the Etruscan Vase, which is, which is a great story in here, where they're talking here about this guy called Massini, who's, who's who's died but he's, he's renowned as a bore in his in his life and one of them say he almost bored me to death said colonel um Beaujou. can you imagine i once had to travel 200 leagues with him um, did you know sinclair asked that he was responsible for the death of poor old richard thornton um, whom you all knew um but surely you know jules replied that he was killed by brigands near fundy he says quite so but as you'll see, Massigny was <laughs> at least an accessory to the crime. A number of travellers, including Thornton, had arranged to travel to Naples in a group as a protection against brigands. Massigny wanted to join their party. As soon as Thornton got wind of this, he went on ahead aghast, I suppose, at the prospect of spending all those days with him. He set off alone, and the rest you know. Thornton was right, said Thameen. Of the two deaths, he chose the more merciful. Anyone else would have done the same in his place. <laughs> extremely arch, um, almost kind of like what you'd find in like an like a Oscar Wilde story there. So it can be just as arch and, and witty as um, Catherine Mansfield, but it's not got this kind of um, reformist kind of bent. And also what you'll see is, at the time of Mary May, um, as, I, as, I, as I indicated, you know, the writer did not command the cultural capital particularly because they wrote Whereas by, by the time we get to Catherine Mansfield, that's pretty much all of their kind of cultural capital. Um, although this is one reason I have a problem with Catherine Mansfield. She doesn't really want to mention that she's loaded. You know, she doesn't want to mention that she's very wealthy. <laughs> OK, so she belongs to um, a lot of this generation who were quite wealthy, like Virginia Woolf. And um, they didn't have any access directly to political power. So as mass society had developed, and um, there's mass literacy. The way they went about trying to influence society was not through their personal connections, but it was more through um, getting involved in um, social movements. And that could be like um, teaching at these working class institutes or very uh, popular, the pamphlet culture, writing pamphlets at the Fabian Society or <laughs> whoever it was, and trying to push reform in this way by, by converting the public and creating pressure from the public. Now, I leave it to you which you prefer. Um, I do have a, a real soft spot for the earlier, like the romanticism, and um, I particularly admire the, uh, the writings of um, Sir Walter Scott. If you want a tran transitional figure, the one in my previous video that I uploaded today, Conan Doyle is a great example of a transitional figure because he enjoyed enormous success with his home stories, but he felt that they um, were not serious. They were entertainment, so kind of frivolous. And he always had this kind of um, uneasy relationship, having so much success with what he felt were not um, pieces of great literature. So he's kind of standing on the, on the, the cusp, you know, between um, Mansfield's um, emerging view, where you get the, 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 the writer who is also the critic 
and the essayist and the pamphleteer and everything centers upon their writing activity and you have that kind of gentlemanly tradition that Conan Doyle belongs to but mass culture is kind of seizing upon his creations and, and kind of um, emphasizing only one small part of what he is at the expense he feels of other matters and he did also engage in kind of lively correspondence just like Mansfield did and try and shape public opinion through his uh, endless <laughs> letters to the editor most famously probably was on foreign policy and also divorce he was very hot on granting people the right to divorce if they didn't love each other anymore so both great collections um, I'd, I'd love some uh, comments if anyone's uh, familiar with either of these texts and you can just tell me your own thoughts if you've made it this far congratulations it's a little uh, shorter this time mercifully and I will leave you now until the next time uh, take care be safe be strong and uh, I'll see you anon nanu nanu